Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the first uh, of our Old Blue live talks. Um, hopefully the technology is on our side today, but please bear with us if it all starts to go a bit wrong uh, through the transitions. We are going to try our best. Um, if you have any questions uh, for Matthew throughout the talk, please type them into your Q&A box at the bottom and we will get through as many as we can um, at the end. Uh, so please welcome today's speaker, uh, Matthew Oates. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for coming along and thank you, Gina and indeed CH for, for setting us up for, for us all. And welcome, 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 everybody. Um, I'm going to do uh, a bit of ecology, uh, a bit of geography, uh, a bit of environmental psychology, a bit of environmental philosophy, uh, a fair bit of poetics, um, a reasonable bit of agriculture, um, hints of economics, which I don't understand, and a tiny bit of theology, uh, and possibly, amongst all that, a tiny bit of common sense. Uh, now, the pictures which Gina's uh, um, organising uh, are there to give you something better to look at than a rather decrepit old blue. Um, and crucially, I've got the lowest boredom threshold in the world. So if I start being boring, I'll be the first person to drop off. So do feel free to join me uh, in that. Uh, and my, end, my main aim is to stimulate some thinking and, and some uh, discussion. You know, we're CH, we think these things through, we work these things through. Please, 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 I do not know all the answers. I may not know any answers at all. I'm merely a pilgrim in the world of nature, a pilgrim in the natural world. I'm not professor of nature at Oxford or Cambridge. There are no professors of, of nature, what I can gather anywhere in the world, not even at Oxford or Cambridge. Um, it's a shame because that would actually bridge, such a discipline would bridge all the arts, including philosophy and psychology and the sciences, including medical sciences, and bridge the faiths as well. So maybe that needs setting up. What we've got instead, of course, is a lot of professors of biodiversity and biodiversity this and that. It's interesting because the word biodiversity, which was born really in the mid 1980s, um, and the environment was a word which came into being, I think about 1942. Prior to them, um, that's what we call nature now. In fact, nature is bigger than that because it includes our imagination. I'll come to that towards the end. Um, but prior to those two words coming along, uh, we talked about nature with a small n. The Romantic poets talked about nature with a capital N. And then if you go further back in time, it was called creation with a big C. Um, now, uh, next slide, please. That's um, snails, by the way, escaping from the maths, double maths. Um, this is five, four miles down the road from from uh, CH, this is Net Wildland, aerial photographs taken in 2001 and 2012, and you can see the change. Since 2012, it really has um, treed up, scrubbed up massively, it's just glades, uh, open glades all over the place. It's a mosaic of trees, scrub, and uh, grassland glades. And I'm using this to say that, that first and foremost, and, and crucially, farming, Agriculture is our default setting for nature and indeed for the countryside in the UK. Very few of our landscapes have not, haven't been radically altered by agriculture. Um, even the mountain tops above the tree line, we haven't got much of which is above the tree line, of course, in our islands. And perhaps only glaciation has actually had a greater impact on the state of our, of our countryside and agriculture. Um, so agriculture is, is what we perceive, it's what we experience uh, of the countryside and, um, and of its nature. Um, it's jumbled up, of course, with bits of forestry, mining, including quarrying, and our very varied and extensive coastline also impact greatly on our uh, experience of nature and the countryside. But farming is the biggie. And actually, most of us know pretty precious little about it. It's become rather a world apart, you know, with its own specialist language um, uh, and, and idiolects, but so have all professions, really. Um, increasingly, we've had agricultural revolutions, including the biggest lot, which has taken place during the second half of the 20th century. Um, and we Brits have become conditioned to accept agricultural landscapes as, as right. 
um, and as and, and as natural, in fact, as as, as well. Um, next one, please, uh, Gina. Thank you. Um, um, but each generation receives and accepts less nature, less biodiversity, less natural habitat than its predecessor, less available outdoor space, and in England, probably less freedom to roam as well. And of course, more concrete, more tarmac, more congestion, more traffic noise. And perhaps the Brexit vote, sorry to use the B word, there was a cry for help. It's rather like going down steps with each generation um, experiencing and seeing and handing on less nature uh, to its successor, to its, to its children. Um, and um, that's evident, really, if you have a look at the, the first generation uh, on your left of the uh, Ladybird uh, What to Look For books, um, and the second generation, which is just, just out very recently, uh, on, on your right. Um, on your left, you're looking at my early childhood. It was going, uh, but that's what the countryside was like. Um, and I reveled in it. It made me a naturalist from the age of about three or four, possibly younger. Um, and yet it's, it's, it's I think, um, uh, the latest book, What to Look For in Summer 2001, actually just, just looks like biodiversity rather on the cover. England's green and pleasant land is now largely a, a single tone of green, fertilised grassland. Um, apart from in the better quality agricultural land, which are blue green of wheat and the lighter green of barley, and then the splashes of, of yellow in April, early May with, with oil seed rape. None of those are our natural colours. Um, ask um, any art historian or, or just look at the old landscape pictures, Constable, etc. Habitat loss you know about, it's horrific. The most commonly quoted figure is 98% of old meadowland, which is what we were looking at at the left, what that farmer's cutting, and his old Fergie, 98% of that has been lost. Um, and much of it is still grassland. It's just that it's ryegrass, Italian ryegrass, fertilised monocultures. Uh, but of course, if you stand on the crest of the South Downs at Ditchling or Devil's Dyke and look north over the Weald, I wish I could, um, it just looks so heavily wooded. That's a deception provided by the veteran oaks that stand sentinel along the roads and, and hedges. There's a lot of deception out there. Uh, and I think we rather like it. Uh, T.S. Eliot in early on in the four quartets comes up with an amazing line. He writes, humankind cannot bear very much reality. In other words, we'd rather not know. I've had a lot of time thinking about uh, uh, that, that, that line, meditating on it. Uh, next piggy, please. Um, there we go, this is more of my early childhood. This is serious. Um, and of course, the 20th century agricultural revolution was based on, well, it actually really started with the dig for victory um, uh, uh, during the um, uh, Second World War. The roots actually go back to um, uh, the First World War. We also had huge pro problems. Um, and then, of course, the machinery and the chemicals which have come in and the common agricultural policy, which was there to maximise food production. But, and it's been hugely successful at it, give it credit, but at enormous hidden um, environmental cost and arguably enormous human health cost as well, which is something we're becoming more and more aware of. Um, and, and really what's, what it's done is it's changed our soils from being things which were biological, biochemical, to something which is chemical with a bit of biology in it. So there's an imbalance there. And in, indeed, many of our soils are effectively dead, notably um, drained, um, desiccated, dried up peatlands, the lowland peatlands of, of, of East Anglia and Lincolnshire. Um, and they're, of course, deemed grade one agricultural uh, soil. I'll go on a tiny bit of a side now, just talk about farmland soils, because in the UK, they're, they're divided into five, five grades. Uh, one and two, which is good stuff, uh, rich, fertile soil. Uh, three, which is rather dodgy. Um, you can grow food and make money out of it if you're clever. And four or five, which are perhaps good for a few sheep, with the old cow and trees and soldiers and horsey culture. Now, Sussex um, has a bit of high grade agricultural land uh, around the coastal plain uh, around Chichester. Uh, but most of it is grade three or grade four and actually produces not that much food. 
the heavy wheel clay on which CH stands is grade three, grade four agricultural land. Uh, the tide of, of intensification is, is, is now turning. It, it's a wondrous time for, for, to, to be alive, actually. As well. It's being turned primarily by many of our farmers because they've had enough. Um, and I'm talking about the organic movements, the uh, new, uh, the nature friendly farming um, movement, which is fantastic what they're doing. Um, as they're working in partnerships over large areas of, of, of landscape and something uh, new which is kicking off now which is called regenerative, regenerative agriculture, which is primarily seeking to mend soil. And they're getting pretty good support from the government, from DEFRA in particular, but they really need it from the consumers. And therein lies a bit of a problem. Um, and I think really what's happening is the demise of the common agricultural policy is actually freeing farmers up in many ways. And a lot of them have a good moral conscience and they know that the pendulum swung too far this way. We need to get it back in balance. Um, and uh, I mean, the government's uh, got a new, uh, uh, introducing a new funding scheme called Sustainable Farming in Incentive, and I wish it well. Um, but the main challenge these good farmers uh, face is, is that food is being sold to a highly urbanized public who have very little idea what's in that food and where it comes from. And they're blinded by packaging and advertising, all drowning in packaging, um, all of us. I think Donald Trump's chlorinated chicken has done a bit of a wake up call for, for us all because we can see that as being a step too far. Uh, if it comes over here to the UK, it will probably go to prisons. Um, I don't think anyone else will have it, uh, not even boarding schools. Anyway, next picky, please. Um, and uh, so that I think there were glimmers of, 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 of hope out, out there, but much depends upon us being more savvy about what we eat uh, and more honesty uh, about promotion and advertising and in consumer fashions. And, and especially a much better understanding of, of our farmed environment, um, which would be you know, to, to, terrific. The, the truth is we're actually been living in TV advert land, which is of course a false comfort zone. Greta isn't. Greta's living in the real world and she's frightened. It isn't out nice out there in the real world. Humankind cannot bear very much reality. But consumer, con consumer choice is everything, but it gets manipulated and we get told what to like and what's good for us. And we don't get told by Professor Chris Whitty. We actually need, surely, we need more Chris Whitties. We need to hear from them more often, perhaps. And now on, the medics can have a greater say in, 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 in how the, the countries run. Um, but moving on a little bit, our landscapes reflect the values, aspirations and technological abilities of their inhabitants. Present and past. The past gets buried and the present rules. I used to work with archaeologists, so what I can tell you about them is they're brilliant people. They're always late for a meeting because they don't have a sense of time. Um, geologists are even worse, by the way. Uh, right, let's move on quickly, because we're, I'm, I'm starting to get silly. Uh, thank you, Gina. Should be a, here we go, one of these things coming on. Um, this is a large blue butterfly. Uh, I, I worked in nature conservation for four, I don't mind saying, rather gruesome decades. Um, John Bishop was obsessed with preserving and restoring habitats and species which we valued, stopping things getting rarer. And there was a, been a massive effort for made for rare species with some success, but it's limited success. We certainly brought this butterfly, the large blue butterfly, back from extinction um, uh, and uh, back from beyond the ninth gate of death. And we've done the same with the red kite and the white tailed eagles um, coming, coming back now because um, uh, we finally worked out what this butterfly actually needs, why it become extinct and then moved heaven and earth to, to bring it back. And, and, and heaven and earth can indeed be moved. But conversely, let's go on up to, to the next the next picture. Next picture, please, uh, Gina. There we go. Um, this is a butterfly I did a lot of work on. Um, it was formerly, it used to be locally common in woods and on lower moorland edges. It flew in Shelley Wood, bang next door to CH. It flew in most of the woods um, 100 years ago. 
um, around Christ Hospital, um, it died out during the 50s, possibly the early 60s, just before my time. Um, and there's been a massive conservation effort being made for it, which is very sadly, I, I'm pretty sure, failing. Um, this butterfly is probably doomed um, to really to a combination of climate change and atmospheric nitrogen deposition, which does messes up conditions for the caterpillars. And, and it's the caterpillar that matters more than the butterfly, of course. Um, I won't go into the complexities, but basically we were getting somewhere with this butterfly and then climate change and nitrogen deposition have really messed things up for us. Uh, on top of that, it's a big butterfly in these large areas of landscape and needs to be able to move around. Um, and our, too many of our habitats are fragmented and, and increasingly isolated. But we don't have any criteria for recognising lost causes. Uh, this you're looking at may well be a, a lost cause. And as I said, culturally, we, we value things that are rare um, and special. And we tend to rather ignore the commonplace. We tend to take them for granted. And that's why vast parts of urban Britain have lost their house sparrows, for example. Um, next picky, please. I think it's some cows. Here we are. Um, ecology has got very, very keen on... Um, uh, the concepts of, of keystone species which actually drive the ecology and cattle grazing animals drive terrestrial ecology um, uh, here in the UK and of course these guys used to function in migratory herds uh, with their movements being driven by the seasons and by circling predators well that's gone and it's not going to come back um, and uh, uh, Something in the background, if you heard it, was one of my cats shooting out in the hurry. She's got bored. Um, grazing ecology, in other words, how cattle, sheep and so on behave and the impact they have um, on vegetation communities and the associated insects and biodiversity. That was my main area of specialism during the 80s, 90s and early 100s. And I, I might have been getting quite good, good with it. Um, but then climate change and uh, atmospheric nitrogen deposition kicked in um, and moved the goalposts and tilted the pitch, changed the shape of the ball and brought in a completely barking mad VAR system. And basically what happened is my so-called expertise in inverted commas got completely and spectacularly torpedoed uh, and I'm all at sea with it now. It's much easier to stick in uh, these key drivers of the ecology, like this lovely herd of longhorn cattle from that uh, wildland down the road, and accept what they get, big view, but that might not give you high brown fertilities and large blues. That's the problem. Uh, next picture, please. Uh, right, beavers are all the rage at the moment. Um, it is a keystone species, a riverine um, architect. Uh, and the business case to, for reintroducing beavers to the UK to help alleviate flooding problems driven by mild wet winters um, and climate change is actually pretty strong. And we've got beavers four miles down the road from CH at, at, at NEP in, in the um, headquarters of the River Ada. Uh, and you being beavers, they've um, rather escaped and ex ex um, expressed themselves doing what beavers do, which is what you're looking at there. Another biggie, um, in the UK nature conservation movement at the moment is, I mentioned already, is joining up the, uh, the fragments of habitat that are left. Uh, uh, this is really, I'm talking about everything south of the Highland Line in Scotland, the habitat continuity um, uh, in, in the Heart Scottish Highlands is actually pretty good, um, but south of there, south of the Highland Line, it's, it's, it's pretty awful. Um, a big report was commissioned by the government in 2010 which is called the Lawton Review, um, and it called really for England for wildlife uh, and ecological networks to be much bigger, better and more joined up, bigger, better and more joined up to cope with um, uh, these problems of increasing problems of habitat fragmentation and isolation and enable species to move around more because they need to be able to do more um, given uh, the increasing issues of, of um, problems posed by, by climate change. 
it's, it's a great report um has a great vision and it's technically right and whether it's going to happen especially post covid um is is really another another matter now we're doing well um can we have next picky please and another really big issue in, in, in nature conservation right now uh, in the UK is this issue of new nature um, versus restoring old nature. So going uh, into this, let's just stick some cows in here um, and some deer and maybe some ponies and rootling pigs, that sort of thing, which is what we're doing at Net down the road, uh, and accept the wildlife, the biodiversity, the, the, the landscape forms which were given versus, no, it, this, this is a really important site. We've got to get it back to how it was 50, 100 years or whatever it was ago. So there's this big argument um, in nature conservation about new nature versus old nature and what we can actually restore or, or conserve, um, for, for what we can time capsule. Um, and it's terribly difficult because we, what we found is we can't actually go back very far in time. Um, as a line in a Bob Dylan song, you can always go back, but you can't go back all the way. So I think Sashi says a lot, it resonates here uh, quite, quite deeply. And we can't restore fully what was, even if we know what was. Um, and that nature, very uh, importantly, is something which cannot be time capsuled, it cannot be fossilized. Um, we can't keep it as it is, like we can say uh, a, a, an historic mansion or a, a medieval um, cathedral. And having worked for the National Trust, I can tell you, it costs a fortune to keep the, uh, old mansions and indeed cathedrals uh, uh, restored and repaired. But new nature, which is what you're looking at down the road, this was farmland um, up to 2003. This is a dairy farm you're looking at. Um, new nature is cheap and it's open-ended and it accepts what we're given. Uh, it accepts changes and it doesn't have specific ends or targets. Um, so it's a really good example of new nature. It's, but it is an, an open-ended experiment of what we call process-led ecology. Uh, and that gives us within fairly, fairly broad parameters, um, uh, the, what the cattle, deer, ponies, and the rootling pigs give us. And it's actually an amazing amount of of biodiversity. You're looking at the best site in England for purple emperor butterflies, which I've studied um, in depth, for turtle doves, and one of the best sites in Britain for nightingales, um, and a beautiful landscape. And that's all happened by, by happy chance. I love that word, um, uh, serendipity. It, it means a lot. So there you have it. Nature is opportunistic. Next biggie, please. Mm. Lovely. Here we are, back home. Um, what on earth do we mean by conservation? What on earth do we mean by nature conservation? Well, it turned out there was no definition of either. So we got in contact, as the National Trust uh, that was, got in, contacted with, uh, got, in got in contact with the philosophy department at Lancaster University and, and said, help, we need help. And they came up with a, a wonderful definition of, of nature conservation, the gist of which you're looking at. That is the, well, so it's a definition of conservation, sorry, not just nature conservation the careful management of change uh, to ensure the transfer of most features of significance from one generation to uh, another. Um, and uh, it's, it's an interesting um, uh, definition. The, 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 the key bit is features of significance, what uh, are valued effectively. Um, and moving those key features from one generation, uh, from one part of time uh, to another. So it's a management of time, the philosophy of time as much as anything else. Their definition was much, 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 much longer than that. Uh, philosophy is seldom succinct. Poetry is, uh, and which is why it is important. And of course, nothing in nature stands still. The, the only constant is, is change. Um, so anyway, there you have it. Conservation is probably about what we value, features of long-term significance, which are valued by one generation and another. But um, of course, our values change uh, uh, over time. Human values are varied and they constantly change. Um, and they're obscured by um, um, uh, assumption. And we have problems phrasing them properly and communicating them properly. 
Uh, yeah. When I started, nature conservation was something just a few top academics uh, did, um, usually outside their mainstream teaching work. And it was voluntary work for everyone else. I started as a volunteer. And something wonderful came, came along called the 1981 Wildlife and Countryside Act, which actually made nature conservation grow up and become a business. And it is a business now. And we were fighting. We were fighting against destruction and extinction. Um, and we acquired small handkerchief nature, nature reserves. And we tried to protect the big crown jewels, the top really important sites, um, uh, important national European level. Uh, and by paying wealthy landowners or landowners rather not to wreck them. Um, and now there's a huge biodiversity industry, much of it part of, of government, and it's very, very orientated towards targets and monitoring and reporting systems. And that's where the jobs are. They're in that, in a biodiversity industry, and also, as, and increasingly, I think, in people, in facilitating people's visits to the outdoors, in other words, public access. With regard to the targets, very few of them are ever met. Most of them are kicked down the road and then quietly ditched. Beware of false prophets, it saith in the good book. And of course, nature doesn't recognize our targets. It doesn't have an agenda. It doesn't have an agenda at all. It just is. And there's no balance of nature. That's the balance of nature bit. It's just about us actually interfering, um, shooting the predators or whatever it is we don't like. Money for nature conservation in this country has largely come uh, from the uh, EU's agri-environment support system. Um, that's changing radically now we've left the, the, the EU. Um, and nature conservation here has got a massive funding crisis, which is going to be thrown into further confusion um, by uh, the pandemic, the impacts of, of the pandemic. What's big at the moment, have the next picky, please, uh, Gina, thank you, um, is tree planting. Because uh, tree planting is all the rage now. Uh, everyone's doing it with them, trust, national trust, and so on, um, and bless them in many ways. Um, uh, and it's partly in response to climate change and partly because people like trees. Um, what we find, actually, is most planted trees actually die. And more important than that, most the trees are quite, actually quite capable of planting themselves, which is what's happened in that picture there. Uh, 20, less than 20 years ago, that was an open field. It's planted itself up rather spectacularly. So do nothing in this country below the tree line uh, equals trees, um, with the exception of just a few coastal habitats, some cliff tops, some sand dunes, and perhaps some lower floodplains. When we step back, the land goes to trees, slowly or rapidly, that's what it does. And we seem to need and like trees, um, not just for oxygen and, 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 and capturing carbon, but, but spiritually, we were forest people. Then we cleared the great forests. Right, next picky, which is rather a tricky one, we're gonna have to click several times. Um, more clicks, please. There we go. Um, I'm introducing environmental psychology, which is something that fascinates me. I'm not an expert on it. There's one more, please, I think, one more click. There we go. Um, but if I was doing A-levels this summer, heaven help us, um, I'd be wanting to go to university to study environmental psychology because I really believe this is the area which is actually um, going to explain um, and, and prove what's going on inside our own heads um, and, and where the real needs is. Uh, and this is a piece of work done by Professor Miles Richardson of Derby uh, University. Um, the, the pathways, why we need nature, the pathways to our engagement with nature. Um, sort of the, the importance of sensory contact. And here he says, factual knowledge will change 2% of people. So telling you about the decline of this and that butterfly or bits of biodiversity will change 2% of people's minds. Emotional experience will change 69%. David Attenborough said, said basically exactly the same thing. Um, the importance of our emotions, the importance of emotional bonds. Um, and he says, the psychologists say, we feel before we think. I certainly do. Um, the importance of beauty uh, was so, so important for, for us in the National Trust, the importance of beauty. And, uh, and of course, it helps build a relationship with nature. And it's a journey. It's not just beauty. It's, it's that there's a, a sense of awe because nature is raw in tooth and claw as well. And this is the old picturesque um, uh, 
uh, beauty and, and the sublime, uh, which brings in the awe, the frightening, the nasty side of, of nature. And then this whole business of meaning, of symbolism, of metaphor, and our importance with relationship with place, um, uh, and the importance uh, below of, of, of heartfelt um, of, of relationships as well. What environmental psychology has done, which is really amazing, um, is that they found that the part of the brain called the amygdala lights up and produces beneficial body chemicals for us. Uh, when we're somewhere nice, like Arnside Knot, which is that lovely photograph we've all been dreaming and uh, 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 into, um, it's the south end of, the, of, of our beloved Lake District. Um, and so the amygdala lights up and benefits our body chemically when we're somewhere nice. It begs the question of what on earth happens when we're somewhere nasty. Um, and it responds to the colour green as well. I've twice been through um, psychometric profiling, which found that um, most important things to me are sunshine and the colour green, foliage. Isn't that amazing? I think it's quite natural. And then this all this links in with this new thing which is coming in from Japan of forest bathing, which has been proven medically to be both uh, good for us physically and mentally, mental and physical well-being. Um, and it reduces stress hormone reduction and improves um, feelings of happiness and free up some creativity, as well as lowering things like heart rate and blood pressure and boosting the immune system and accelerating recovering from illness. Oh, yes, 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 this sounds fantastic. It's preventive medicine. Um, let's move on a bit. I love environmental psychology. I, it comes to you, strongly recommend it. Um, love of place. Yeah, um, environmental psychology is... is to, um, demonstrating the importance of our love of places, um, which we perhaps call, call heartlands. Again, as I said, the amygdala lights up when we're shown a photograph of a place we love, like a favourite holiday resort. We all got favourite holiday resorts. Me, Woolacombe, North Devon, yay. Um, and that is absolutely mega. And this love of places really throughout our poetry and our, our, our literature, um, this is a bit of the preface um, from uh, Swallows and Amazons. Um, and uh, Arthur Ransom really loved the area of South South Lakeland, Connors, Coniston, uh, Windermere. He's buried there actually in the Rustland Valley. I've been to uh, his grave, Rustland Church. It's a very spiritual experience, I recommend it. But he writes, the start of Swallows and Amazons, going away from Coniston, we half drowned in tears, while away from it as children and as grown-ups, we dreamt about it. Swallows and Amazons grew out of those old memories. I could not help writing it. It almost wrote itself. And then later on, he actually said, actually, I didn't write that book. The place wrote it. And a lot of poets and other writers uh, have, have said basically um, the same thing. OK, Jean, let's move, move on. Um, we're doing very well time-wise, by the way. Um, spirit of place. This is something the last few years of the National Trust were, were devoted largely to understanding people's love of place. I moved on from nature conservation into this whole area. And the Trust ran a program on something wacky called Spirit of Place. If you remember Narnia, there's this um, um, uh, world between worlds and jump into a different pool and end up in, an, in, a, in a new world. And so what you're looking at there is part of Savannah Forest. But the Trust uh, ran a, 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 this program on Spirit of Place, which enabled it to really write a few sentences or paragraphs or a bit of a poem that summarised what's special about each individual place. Now, you've hit the nail on the head straight away. What on earth do we mean by a place, macro or micro scale? It's easy for someone like Christ Hospital, but you know, you're talking about just the buildings, or you're talking about all the land, you're talking about the hinterland, Sharpenhurst Hill, which the school owns, the South Downs in the distance. What do you mean by a place? Not easy. Um, but we, did, we in the Trust, we did, did do all this. Um, it was the most wonderful thing I've, I've ever been involved with. Uh, and we tried to work out, um, uh, to arrive at some, some statement, um, some succinct statement about what's special about each individual place in the Trust's care, what makes these places special. And those paragraphs, those sentences, whatever they were, uh, enable the Trust to decide what to do and what not to do 
how to handle change, in other words, how to handle conservation, and how to say yes or, or no to itself, and maybe say, no, we're not going to put a new car park in there and wreck the spirit of the place. Coleridge, yeah, uh, he was a natural metaphysician. He would have loved this. Wordsworth would actually probably been even better at it. And superb at writing spirit of place statements. Uh, and CH, the place, it oozes immense spirit of place. That's what draws the likes of me and other old blues back there. Not fond memories of idle youth. Uh, we've actually forgotten or we've actually wiped uh, what really happened there when we were there. Uh, it's love of place. A love of the place, the landscape, the buildings, the trees, everything. Um, and perhaps CH could go through the spirit of place process. That would help it understand itself fully or more fully. Um, so anyway, that was terrific fun. And I really do recommend it. Let's move on a bit because uh, I'm starting to get bogged down. Right now, this is lockdown because some good has been coming out of the COVID pandemic in the, in the UK. It's too early to say that. I've recently lost a, a, lost a friend. Um, but some good is going to starting to come out of it. And, and it's not just the realisation that we've been pushing the boundaries of nature big time. In fact, we've been living in an unhealthiness epitomised by the London Underground. But somehow the lockdowns, particularly last spring's, the first great lockdown, stimulated a tidal wave of urban-based people getting out in, and discovering and falling in love with the great outdoors, getting out into fresh air, fresher air and greenery. And it quickly became a tidal wave. Um, and it's been augmented, augmented by big increases in the um, uh, number of people owning dogs and, and bicycles. Um, uh, countryside ranger teams have uh, recorded three, four or five fold increases in footfall around urban fringe countryside and similar increases in, in, uh, in dogs. The Ordnance Survey just put out a comparison maps of countryside walks downloaded in January 2020 and in January 2021. And there's an order of magnitude of difference between those two um, time, um, time shots, January 20 and January 21. Throughout England and Wales, away from the, the far-flung extremities, something is massive is happening. And it's happening now. And that wildland just down the road, 30,000 people appeared there from between last June and last um, September, in three dizzy months, out of nowhere. And they fell in love with the place and they haven't seen it at its best yet. And a similar things have been happening everywhere. Massive impacts for uh, 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 implications for footpath services, which obviously turned into quagmires and broadened and a lot of farmers and landowners got upset and fair enough. We were all um, uh, uh, caught napping on this one. In Scotland, conversely, people have a right to roam except in gardens and on arable land, but, 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 um, with a lot of sensible responsibilities as, as well, which are, um, they, they expect you to know. So Scotland seems to have got it right for its five and a half million people. Conversely, 8% of England and 8% of Wales has open access for some 60 million people. Sorry, Boris, wake up. Something massive is happening and it's happening now. Our open places are exceeding their carrying capacity in terms of people's enjoyment, biodiversity, nature, wildlife, and all that. And nature, wildlife will be the first to suffer. Ask the nesting skylarks. Now, we're coming towards the end. And I'm going to end with three, little, three bits of poetry, one long, one short, and one needle. So, Gina, if we just move on. Um, and, uh, right, this is a passage from Wordsworth. Now, much of this is actually pure Coleridge because the two were working together at the time and actually wanted to be one mind, one poet. It didn't work, of course, but they tried it. And I think this offers a really good definition of not biodiversity, but nature, the best I've ever, ever discovered. For I have learnt to look on nature, and I have felt a presence that disturbs me with the joy of elevated thoughts, a sense sublime of something far more deeply interfused, whose dwelling is the light of setting suns, and the round ocean, and the living air, and the blue sky, and in the mind of man, that's pure Coleridge, a motion and a spirit that impels all thinking things, all objects of all thought, 
and rolls through all things. Therefore, am I still the lover of the meadows and the woods? That's Wordsworth. Fantastic. What it's saying in a nutshell is that we are part of nature and it is part of us and that nature includes the human mind and its imagination. Coders would love me for saying that. Greta would understand it. Darwin knew it as well. Next one, please. We're getting there. A uh, tiny quote from Tennyson, actually wrote some bloody good stuff. Um, and it hits on our ability to understand nature right on the head. And he writes, for words like nature, half reveal and half conceal the soul within. In other words, we struggle to understand and express ourselves. And the same is true of nature. We are bound by the limitations of words and our relationship with an understanding of nature is bound by those limitations. We have to break those bounds, which is something which poets and artists are always trying to do. Scientists have a slightly different approach to actually push the bounds back through knowledge, to go to knowledge. Okay, move on. Final picture. We're doing so well. Timekeeping. Look at this. Um, now, I, uh, and then click. Yes, we got that. Um, Right, and this is the greatest of the lot. I have to say, I'm a, I'm a completely unabashed disciple of, of, of Edward Thomas. Um, and this is one of two poems he wrote, um, the first part of one or two poems he wrote, uh, which are both called Home. Often I'd gone this way before, but now it seemed I never could be and never had been anywhere else. It was home, one nationality we had, I and the birds that sang, one memory. They welcomed me. I had come back at eve somehow from somewhere far. The April mist, the chill, the calm meant the same thing, familiar and pleasant to us and strange too, yet with no bar. It goes on for a couple more standards, but there you have it. What he's saying is in nature we belong. Nature is home. Nature is our nationality, our collective memory, our real world. It's these lines, twas home, one nationality we had, I and the birds that sang, one memory. That's everything, that's nature, that's spirit of place, that's all those things I've been trying to talk about and probe around, all bound up together. Um, so there we go. I'm going to wind up now and try and, uh, and deal with some questions. Thank you so much for, for putting up with me. Uh, and um, over to you folks and many, many thanks. Thank you to for all of you for putting up with me for so long. It's been a, a joy, a privilege, a, a deep privilege. Thank you so much, Matthew. Thank you. I think everyone's pretty desperate to get back outside. Uh, a couple more weeks and we'll be there. We can do a bit of traveling around again and hopefully the weather will improve from this as well. Um, I have got a couple of questions. So um, if I put them to you, um, the first one is, what is your opinion on the possible scrubbing up of upland areas if sheep farming <laughs> That's subsidise end, sheep farming subsidies end, big pun. Yeah, well, they are ending. Um, yeah, thank you for that. There was something called the Sheep Annual Premium Scheme, uh, which the um, CAP brought in, um, which basically was part of the let's um, maximise production. Um, and as I suggested, so much of agricultural land, so much farmed land in the UK is actually very low grade agricultural land. And how do we keep people farming in these difficult uh, less favoured areas, as, as, as they were called. Um, and um, uh, it was maximised, 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 and farmers got paid for having more and more stock and the impact on, um, on the vegetation and on the associated biodiversity, the birds and the insects and so on, was quite, quite uh, 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 acute. Um, and... Um, it's the, the, the sheep animal premium scheme ended a few years ago um, uh, and there's been terrific moves to reduce um, sheep numbers um, without 
making farmers go bust. It was a very, very de uh, delicate operation. One of the things we were trying to do was get some um, uh, reduce sheep numbers and actually bring in cattle which graze in a, a, a different way. Um, and get a better balance between between sheep and cattle. And that's happened in many, many, many places. Um, some areas uh, of upland um, were taken out, arrested from grazing for a while. Um, the challenge is how long should they be rested for and how and when do you um, uh, uh, introduce, reintroduce great grazing animals? Um, and, and then how do we socially keep um uh communities based around agriculture going because one of the problems they've had elsewhere in europe been around a bit in europe and up in areas and seeing what's happened is 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 abandonment um uh and that brings a lot of problems to wildlife and biodiversity uh, uh, as, as well um so there's a lot happening. Um, the National Trust, I forget how much upland land it owned in England, England Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, but um, uh, we worked incredibly hard to try and get that balance. The, the show's going on at the moment. Um, there's a struggle in some places between this, the uh, rewilding, the rewilders, and I am in many ways a rewilders. Uh, every wilder um, and you know, and and the farming community uh, as well, which can view rewilding as being uh, abandonment, which it isn't actually. Uh, so it's on it's ongoing. Uh, one thing I will say, and I've hinted it, I've really said it already, is is that you know, there is considerably we're a high uh, population density country, and there are more and more people clamouring for more and more access to effectively less and less land. Um, so it's not just a matter of whether it's grazed or whether it's farmed, it's a matter of human footprint, footfall, um, and what and uh, recreation. Is it really recreation or is it preventive medicine? Uh, it, it, it's this, these, these are big, big, big issues we're trying to think through at the moment. So yeah, that's probably about as far as far as I can go with 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 that one. Um, no easy answers is what you're looking for from me. Lovely, thank you. Okay, uh, so another one here. What can suburban dwellers best do to promote biodiversity within an average small garden? Oh bless, <laughs> lovely. Thanks for that. It, it, it um, there's a lot of information out there in in books and and on websites. Um, and it's good news um, because the answer is basically thoughts. Even a window box will benefit bumblebees. There's really good evidence on that. And if you grow nasturtiums out of a window box, you'll have cabbage white butterflies. There we go, breeding on them. And I found them, I forget how many floors up on the tower block, uh, cabbage whites breeding. Um, so yeah, nature, wildlife gets around. Um, nature gets everywhere, whether we like it or not. Um, if you can have a pond, please have a pond because so much benefits from the pond. But please, 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 if you can, keep out the fish because they eat everything else. Or we'll only have one or two little fish. Um, so um, uh, pond, really, really good idea. Um, unfortunately, we got a, a fetish and Chrysostable illustrates this quite strongly with mown grass. CH has got a lot of mown grass and it's got a bit of an issue as to how it sustains all, all, all that. Um, but if you can let some areas of grass and go rougher, longer and flowery and have flowers in it, that's where you'll get your, your grasshoppers, your butterflies and your bees and so on. And there's a fantastic array of um, plants which are insect pollinated, bees, butterflies, moths, hoverflies, all those guys, they're fantastic. Um, uh, Budley, I'm a great champion of Budleyers. Uh, obviously marjoram's a, a, a terrific one, and uh, verbena um, bonariensis um, is another, is a new, uh, newish plant um, that's come into gardens. It's an absolute top uh, nectar plant for all those guys. Okay, enjoy. Mm -hmm. Lovely. And you answered another question that we had, which was, should we mow our lawns or not? So you've answered uh, two in one there. I'm a cricketer. 
<laughs> as, well, as, as well but yeah a bit too much uh, long long grass we can definitely ease up okay well my husband will be pleased about that because he yeah uh, take some time off get the jet chair out uh i think we've probably got time for one or two more um if someone had a vague um this is uh, referring to a grandchild by the look at it if someone had a vague unfocused desire to work in ecology where might they start or what might they study Wow. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you very, very much for that one. Um, it's changing. The pandemic is going to change it radically. The, the, the loss of CAP funding um, is, is changing the whole thing. I've said that the uh, what's burgeoning at the moment is public access and our relationship with the outdoors. Um, uh, and um, I think that's where the jobs are going to go uh, in access into access and our relationship with places, our relationship with nature, our relationship with with wildlife um, and into the I would rather call it well-being, medical well-being rather than mental health side of side of it as, as well. I think that the future is going to be the jobs are going to be more in that than in say old-fashioned nature conservation which is what was fairly big in my day um, and and in the sort of biodiversity industry now and I also said during my talk that if I was doing my A-levels now uh, I'd be wanting to go to university to read environmental psychology because I think that is really coming up with some some very very good answers indeed okay let's okay. Uh, let's leave it at that yeah um Okay, so would encouraging stepping stones of wild spaces allow endangered species of butterflies and birds, etc., to recover better? Yeah, uh, <laughs> this is all part of bigger, better, and more joined up. This is all part of the Lawson, Law, sorry, Lawton, John Lawton uh, review, um, uh, the 2010 uh, government report. Uh, the importance of stepping stones for our more mobile species. Um, uh, obviously for the birds, the dragonflies, some moths, some, some butterflies, not all butterflies, some, a few butterflies are actually very immobile. And obviously here's a biggie, slugs don't fly. Um, and uh, they have to hitchhike on birds as eggs and things like, things like that. So for the more mobile species, um, stepping, the concept of stepping stone sites and gardens can be very important stepping stones uh, and oases. Uh, feeding up oases for nectar, uh, uh, nectaring for pollinators in particular. Yeah, um, things have got to get better at moving around um, this increasingly fragmented um, uh, landscape we're, we're all living in, not least because of climate change. Okay, that's a good question. Thank you for it. Yeah, we'll go for one uh, one more, which is, should we be planting hedges instead of fences in gardens? <laughs> Lovely. Uh, a simple answer to that, yes. Um, uh, and not just in gardens, please. Um, a lot of hedges were taken out to, uh, during the 1970s when the, the CAP kicked in. It really upset me. I, I, I just sort of went apoplectic with rage. Um, a lot of hedges have come back actually recently um, and um, there's far more hedges being planted these last 20-30 years than have been taken out. Um, but yes, uh, gardens, um, uh, the role of hedges in gardens rather than fences um it is really really uh crucial i've got a fantastic hedge system around my garden here when we moved here there was no hedges at all and the first thing we stuck in was beach and everything else hedges uh and it's bouncing with house sparrows and everything else it has a fantastic time i love my hedges so yes please we need more trees more hedges more bushes in the landscape and in our gardens lovely there we go something for everyone to do this weekend then go and plant some hedges yeah, bless you. Thank I'm going to leave it there on the questions because we're almost out of time. There were a lot more. Um, I think there's a way I can uh, get a list of the questions that we haven't answered to you and then maybe we can um, send them out afterwards to the, to the email system. Yeah, we can do that. So thank you so much.
Fabulous. Thank you so much, Matthew. And thank you everyone for, uh, for joining us today. Um, we have another talk next week. Details will be out on the social media. But again, thank you very much, Matthew, for your time today. Lovely. Thank you so much, everybody.